Our epistle lesson for this morning comes to us from Paul's letter to the church in Rome, the 12th chapter, verses 3 through 8. If you'd like to follow along in the Bibles there in your pews, I'd invite you to do so at this time. It can be found on page 922. Let's all listen for God's word to us today. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually we are members one of another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As I begin this sermon today, it's really more of a homily, a shorter than usual sermon. I can see the smiles on some of your faces when I say that. I hope you do not misunderstand, I hope you do not misunderstand the title. On this Music Sunday, the title of the sermon is Preaching to the Choir, and by using that title, I do not mean to imply that what I'm about to say is intended only for our choirs, and the rest of you can now pull out your phones or take a nap or something like that. I use that title as the figure of speech that you know it already is. When one is preaching to the choir, it means one is preaching to those who already are with you, who already agree with you. And I think you will all agree with me when I make the following three points right now on Music Sunday. Point number one, the choirs, our adult choirs, youth choir, children's choirs, they are among the best and most talented in our entire denomination. Can I get an amen to that? Amen. Good. Second point, these wonderful members of Westminster are able to do what they do through a tremendous amount of hard work on their part and through the excellent leadership of our entire music staff and volunteers and those of us who are not in the choirs are extraordinarily grateful for the beauty and the meaning that they provide to our worship Sunday after Sunday. Can I get an amen to that? Good. Third point, what our choirs and musical leaders do in worship is not only a product of their hard work and their commitment and their dedication, it is at the most fundamental level a gift. The musical abilities that they possess are God's gift to them and our choirs are God's gift to this congregation. Can I get an amen to that? Amen. Good. Now, it's that third point that I'd like to talk with you just a bit about today, that point about gifts. In our text for today, Paul writes, we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. And the most common interpretation of this passage is that everyone, everyone in this room has a gift. Choir members for singing, givers in generosity, teachers for teaching, session members for leading. These are some of the gifts that God wants us to share and to nurture and to grow. That is a faithful reading of this text. Nothing wrong with that interpretation of the text. It places the emphasis on the end of the text, on how we use our gifts. I want us to think about the beginning of the text. What happens when we receive a gift? For by the grace given to me, that's how Paul begins. You see, what Paul believed is that before we can be helpful givers of our gifts, you and I 
are in fact helpless receivers of gifts, utterly in need of one another and completely dependent on God's grace. So let me ask you, do you know what it's like to be a receiver of something? I think you do. I think you do. To be given something, something you did not ask for, something you did not work for, something perhaps you did not deserve, something that just came to you, what is it like to be a receiver? Well, it can be a mixed experience, right? Sometimes it's a slightly embarrassing experience. For example, during the pandemic, when we could only worship online through our recorded services, I noticed something about myself that I did not realize was true. It happened the first time I watched a baptism that was included in the recorded worship. At one point, the video was shot not from straight on, but from one of the cameras up above. And I saw on top of my head this big bald spot <laughs> that I did not know was there. I mean, I knew I was losing my hair, but I did not realize that spot had grown so much. Now, what is that? That's something I received, right? I received it through my genes. What side does it come from? Mother's side? Both sides? I, I don't know. I do know this. There is something in all of us that resists being a receiver sometimes. It feels so much better to be a giver, right? To be a giver. Uh, to do like so many of you did yesterday, participating in Hands-On Greenville with our church, helping other people, getting to know our neighbors, loving our neighbors. It gives us a sense of pride to be able to give. It also gives us a sense of control. Nothing bad about any of that. It's what we're supposed to do with our gifts. But it's much harder, I think, to see oneself as a receiver, as the one without control. Have you ever had one of those moments in your life? I'd like you to think right now of a time when you received something and you did not want it and it was completely out of your control. Many of you know that our younger son was diagnosed with leukemia when he was 17 months old. I am forever grateful that it was a curable kind of cancer. But I'll never forget the night in November of 2010 when my wife and I knew something was wrong, did not know exactly what was going on, we were in the ER at the Children's Hospital in Dallas, and we received the diagnosis. Ugh. What do you do? A completely helpless feeling. And yet at that moment, during that night, receiving took on another dimension as well. You see, the first priority for the medical team was to give him blood. So I have a vivid memory of looking at those bags of blood, which were putting red blood cells and platelets back into our son's body, literally saving his life. And I remember thinking that I will never get a chance to thank the person or to thank the people who gave that blood that provided the first step in saving the life of our child. I will spend the rest of my days being in debt to those strangers, having received a gift from those strangers. And whenever I give blood, I am grateful for those strangers who showed me how important receiving a gift can be. Do you know what it's like? To be a receiver? That's what we're talking about this morning. It's not just an embarrassing thing sometimes or a helpless thing. Sometimes it is a life-giving thing. That's what the Apostle Paul wants us to see today. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, that's what Paul writes. Paul sees himself not as a self-made person, but as God's person, a receiver of God's grace before he is anything else in this world. And Paul wants us to do the same. So let's do that right now. 
There are plenty of examples of God's grace in this room at this very moment. That pew, for example, that you are sitting in today, how many of you built that pew yourself? Right, no show of hands. The beautiful stained glass that you see in the sanctuary, how many of you designed that stained glass yourself? Or how about the teachers who taught your children during Sunday school or its elementary this year? The adult sponsors who took joy in getting to know your teenager at youth fellowship this year? The West Connect group that created new bonds of friendship that you were searching for this year? Who is responsible for all that? For the faith that grew in your child or in your teenager or in you? Or when you were going through a terribly difficult time in your life and members of this congregation reached out to you? Did you plan their visits, order their cards? Did you create their words of comfort? Or did you simply receive them? Did God send those members to you? Going back to the pandemic, I have a vivid memory of what it was like when we came back to worship together but it was not yet safe for us to sing. Do you remember that? Do you remember that? I can't tell you how much I missed our choirs, how much I missed singing hymns when we had no hymns, and I can't sing. <laughs> I mean, I can't match pitch to save my life, but I saw them more clearly than I have ever seen before how much my faith is moved and shaped by the musical gifts in this room today. Do you know what it's like to be a receiver? According to Paul, it means we who are many are one body in Christ and individually we are members one of another. It means we have gifts to share with one another in here and in God's world out there, but even before that, it means something much more fundamental and just as important. It means, as children of God, we spend our entire lives living in the red, in debt to one another and in debt to the grace of the living God. This is your fourth chance. Can I get an amen to that? <laughs> 